We're celebrating the feast of Christ the King. Jesus as Lord of the universe. He is our leader. So I want to ask you a question, a rhetorical question. What is it? What does one need to be a leader? What, what makes somebody a leader? Like what are the qualities that are really needed? That's a great thing to think about. The church has thought about that a lot. The ancient philosopher has thought about that a lot. I've thought about that a lot. I would like you to think about that. I'm going to mention two things that I believe are important qualities of leadership. And ultimately, these are qualities that King David possessed greatly and that Jesus possessed greatly. One, quality of a great leader. Service. A great leader is a servant. Leaders are meant to be servants of their people. That's what it means to be a leader, isn't it? I mean, even in, even in business, you want to have a good business, serve your clients well. You don't have good service, then you're not going to have a leading company. But in terms of service, in terms of leadership, in terms of Christ's leadership, Christ is a, he came not to be served, but to serve what it means to be a leader. Serve the people. Christ wants all of us to be leaders in the church, each in our own way. It's going to begin with humble service. It's very easy when one moves into levels of authority and leadership to do less and less actual service. That's a temptation. Jesus is a wonderful example to us because in his height of, at the height of his leadership, he was an amazing servant to us all. Second quality is to defend, to defend the people. Leaders serve the people and they defend the people, particularly in terms of national leadership, like kings, right, lords. Christ was our king. He defends the people. Look at King David. King David spent his life defending Israel from their enemies. That's why they chose him to become king, if you're listening to the first reading, because he was the one who was constantly leading Israel into battle, placing his life in jeopardy so that the people would be safe. True leaders defend the people. I imagine that, that our wars today would look very different if our leaders were the ones that, that were the first in the battle and the last out, like King David was. The great kings of old did that. They were the first ones in and the last ones out. They're the ones that defended their people because that's what service is. We see that in Christ Jesus. We have humble service. It's very interesting that biblically, shepherds are the ones who oftentimes take up roles of great leadership, like King David, because that's what shepherds did. They were completely at the service of the sheep and they defended them. Thus, the shepherd was the, is, the, is, the, is the great model, scripturally, for one to become a leader. Shepherds can't take time off. Oh, I'm going to take a break for the afternoon. I'm kind of tired of this. Nope, it's, it's too bad. I worked on dairy farm growing up. Any of you worked on a dairy farm? You know about cows? You don't ever take a day off. The cows happy milked every day. Every day, every day, there's no break, ever, ever. That's what it means to be of service. So shepherds, always leading and defending. Just think about parents who are supposed to be the leaders of their family. Is that not what their role is to do, is to serve and defend? What, would you, what, what do we do when parents don't defend their children? We, call them, we don't call them good leaders and good parents. Today, in, this morning at Mass at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, Pope Francis displayed the relics, the bones of St. Peter on the high altar while the, the creed was being sung. By the way, we're not the only ones that sing the creed. Let me know that. So the bones of St. Peter on the altar. It's the first time a pope has done that since Pius XII had, had, arche, had uh, archaeologists go under the altar and they found the bones of St. Peter. The church has always believed that the altar... St. Peter was built over the tomb of, of St. Peter. We just didn't have the skills to get there. 
So in the 40s, Pius XII had them go down and they found them. They found this tomb that said, Peter is here. They had all this ancient graffiti and they found these bones wrapped in purple and gold claws. And the scientists looked at the bones and discovered them to be the bones of, of, uh, of a man in roughly, roughly from the ages of 60 and 70. Cool, huh? Pope Francis put the bones up on the altar for the creed today. Why did he do that? To be honored, why? When Pope Benedict was elected as the Pope, this Father Robert Barron tells this story in, in his Catholicism series. It's beautiful. That all the cardinals, they go over to Rome and they elect the Pope, right? You've probably seen that on, on the news. And when the Pope gets elected, they all come out on the balcony and all the cardinals are there, and then the Pope comes out, right? And so Cardinal George, who's the Archbishop of Chicago, was out there, and he was waiting for the Pope. And, and he's standing there, really pensive, looking out over, over Rome. He's looking, and you could see him in the camera. And when he got home... They, he was interviewed and asked, what were you thinking? Because he just looked so pensive, staring out over, over Rome. And he said this. Cardinal George said he was, because from his perspective, he looked out over the ruins of Rome, over the Palatine Hill, and the old abandoned palace of the Caesars where the Caesars used to live. And now it's a ruin. And he said, I thought to myself, where are the descendants of Julius Caesar? Where are they? The great empire of Rome, where are their descendants? Where's the descendants of Nero and Titus? Where are they? In fact, where are the descendants of all the great empires of the world? They've all gone away. But yet, the descendant of St. Peter is right here next to me, 2,000 years later. The successor of Peter is standing right here next to me. That is, in the kingdom of Christ, Christ established a kingdom, and he said to Peter, Peter, you are a rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And that Christ gave his authority to the church, that Peter, in a, in a sense, stands and he speaks for the person of Christ, that he's our access to Jesus in a very real sense, not the only sense. And that is still here with us today, that the kingdom of Christ is still in our midst 2,000 years later. Think about that. Any of you who've ever studied any sort of history or civil, Western civilization, kingdoms come and kingdoms go like crazy. The church is still here 2,000 years later. And we have the bones of St. Peter on the altar and Pope Francis, his successor, is still there to reverence them. An unbroken chain of succession for 2,000 years because Christ has continued to serve and defend his church as promised. That's us. We're still here. Isn't that amazing? We belong to the kingdom of Christ. And we gather here tonight to worship and honor God because he is a king worthy of following. He is a king worthy of our allegiance, right? How many of us, you know, growing up, we have to make, we make the Pledge of Allegiance in school. We pledge our allegiance, right? And that's a good thing to do. But we're pledging our allegiance to Christ above all. And that's definitely worth it. We definitely should pledge our allegiance to Christ because he is a servant. I've come not to be served, but to serve, and he does that. And he defends us because he loves us. And he wants us to be with him forever in heaven. Happy Feast of Christ the King. We belong to that kingdom. And may tonight you pledge anew your allegiance to Christ, that you would accept him more as Lord of your life and follow his ways. Happy feast day. God bless you.